all this millennial cultural goodwill generated by classic gaming, this energy and enthusiasm has been persistent, you know? It's kind of infected the Zoomer consciousness just through osmosis, through content creators, speedrunners. And the fact is, there's still a lot of interest in the games from this golden age of the industry. Full-blown remakes, triple A remakes being something that is not only viable, but at this point, a preferred strategy in selling these insanely expensive triple A games. A new generation must experience the Metal Gear series. They must experience Silent Hill. For whatever reason, a straight up remaster is simply not enough anymore. Final Fantasy VII, all of these classic titles from my heyday are back. And, you know, there was a time not so long ago where your boy here wasn't opposed to the idea of remaking some of these games. In the mind of the millennial gamer in the 2000s, you know, there was this potential that excited a lot of people. The industry was still culturally healthy. We're seeing the hardware become more and more powerful. Graphics become more advanced. Physics simulations become more realistic. Optimism for the future of the industry growing. And naturally, you ask yourself the question, what would my favorite game look like if it was made today? You know, if the same team, the same creators used the same design document to create the project, but with all of the contemporary tools and craftsmanship offered by modern technology, I mean, it was something that excited the millennial gamer in all of his naivete and hubris. What if I could replay my favorite game of all time and for the impact to be just as profound as when I was a little kid? Seeing PS1 graphics for the first time, my mind being blown. And then the years pass, you grow up and you lose that sense of awe for this technology. What if you could get that back? I guess that is the promise of a great remake because, you know, good remakes do exist even in this current period of stagnation. I mean, look at the Persona 3 remake. But it almost seems like language is failing us right now. When we label something remake in the contemporary period of gaming, personally, I'm not really sure what we're even referring to anymore. Because on the production side, on the developer side, there seems to have been a profound shift in philosophy when it comes to remaking games. I mean, there is a vast chasm in terms of ethos between the GameCube remake of Resident Evil 1 and the recent Final Fantasy VII multi-part extravaganza of a project. You know, because when I think back to that GameCube remake of Resident Evil 1, the platonic ideal of a video game remake it is faithful, it's respectful and reverent of the original game. It uses the same basis for design, the same aesthetics to the point that the game is still pre-rendered with 2D backgrounds in an era where fully 3D graphics were the norm. We're talking about the sixth generation here. This was the GameCube, circa 2002. And yet this Resident Evil remake had its gaze firmly pointed into the past taking the concept of the original survival horror game and all of its 2D, pre-rendered, clunky, tank control, primitive glory and bringing it forward. And instead of looking for things to change about the original, it was more about taking the key elements of Resident Evil 1 and just refreshing them, expanding on them, enhancing them. The original being used as almost like a storyboard for the remake. And even though a lot of the dialogue itself was rewritten to sound a little less awkward, a little less goofy, all of the key plot beats are hit. You know, it's fundamentally the same story, the same characters. So what you get is ultimately something that feels very familiar. The original game's philosophy is unmolested. If anything, it is used as the basis for the remake itself realized using this new technology for a new generation of gamers with new hardware but you know the soul of the game and crucially the atmosphere remains intact the resident evil 1 remake is simply ludo of the highest order and we all know it but 
The same can't be said for a lot of these modern remakes that seem more than willing to exploit the brand recognition and popularity of these classic games without paying the proper respect. In fact, a lot of these developers actually hate that era of gaming. They view it as a backwards time filled with sexism, misogyny, racism, and of course, lack of diversity. I mean, this is why we now have these ESG consultants like Sweet Baby Inc., Black Girl Gamers, etc. You know, they're here to fix these severe systemic ills characteristic of orthodox gaming. Because, you know, in the case of the recent Tomb Raider trilogy remaster, I know it's not a remake, but, you know, it's a great example of just how fucked the industry is right now when you have a character like Lara Croft, an iconic video game character. And this remaster, contrary to what I was expecting, is actually brilliant. It's lovingly put together. It's so well done, it almost becomes a remake in that it looks incredible. The engine is just so smooth. It runs at like a 120 FPS 4K like butter. And yet the code, or at least the code base, is the same. It's the same game, one to one. And yet somehow this clown car of an industry finds controversy in this remaster project. Why? Well, I didn't really understand or realize this, but apparently the original Tomb Raider trilogy is looked upon with extreme prejudice by modern video game developers and journalists. They hate classic Lara's design. They hate the classic Tomb Raider game's premise, i.e., you know, a wealthy, high-born, white British woman gallivanting across the world in search of treasure, a smug colonial glint in her eye, with no qualms about gunning down small animals and native tribesmen in pursuit of said booty. You know, unlike the rebooted version of Lara that Crystal Dynamics put together, this extremely salty, uncurvy, unfeminine, Oxford postgraduate feminist with mental health issues, like, this sucks. <laughs> you know, guys, this is embarrassing. But I'm being told apparently it's necessary because old school Lara is simply offensive to modern audiences. So much so that Crystal Dynamics had to include a disclaimer at the beginning of this remaster. Similar to like an epilepsy warning, it's saying, warning, the original Tomb Raider is so backward, so racist, so sexist, so bigoted, that you need to be warned, careful, based contents under pressure. This game may not be appropriate for you, i.e. communist transsexual redditor. Watch out. Anyway, over to Aspire, who actually developed the game and clearly loved Tomb Raider. These fucking assholes at Crystal Dynamics. This is one of the most pathetic things I've ever seen. And I bring it up because it really is indicative of the health of the industry at this point, you know? That we are overrun with these awful ideologues they cannot be reasoned with, they are purging the culture of gaming. To disrespect such an iconic character and an IP like Tomb Raider, I mean, the industry itself owes so much to Core and that original team of young white British men that pushed the technology to the next level, broke ground, and brought acclaim to the whole industry, worldwide acclaim. They deserve respect not a disclaimer. I mean, it's outrageous. And really, it shows you that this is not a fertile climate for remakes or remasters, because, you know, at this point, the industry has openly declared its disgust with legacy gaming and gamers, and even some of gaming's most iconic and well-loved characters. And also this need to correct the ills of this industry. But you know, at the same time, none of their new IPs, their woke IPs, are selling for shit. We realize that making good games with cool characters is actually fascist, right? So we're going to just make annoying black female Afro characters in every game from now until forever. And if you don't like it, we'll obviously line you up against the wall during the communist revolution. We'll have you shot. Anyway, please still buy our game. Please still buy Redfall. But I'm definitely going to shoot you during the revolution, but buy the game. You know, it's like, this is the attitude of modern devs. This is the insanity of Western gaming that 
In the pursuit of political correctness and some kind of Marxist perfection that involves ruining this entire industry, the prospect of a remake actually becomes quite difficult to even comprehend, right? Because people that hate us and hate our industry and culture are nonetheless going to plunder our history and our historical titles for ideas, for content, because of course they can't create anything of equal value. And then they're going to fuck with it. They're going to impose their freakazoid postmodern values onto this art and try and resell it to us. If we have any issues with it, they will shame us, gaslight us. And curiously, the term remake no longer implies any kind of respect or reverence for the original title. Things will be changed. A lot of the time, it is for ideological reasons. It's like the Demon Souls remake. Despite being more of a kind of Tomb Raider remaster style affair in that the code is basically the same, they still call it remake, but it, the code is the same. Again, this gets very convoluted, but the fact is they made the Crestfallen Knight black. <laughs> so, because that was so necessary, right? Miyazaki, he really dropped the ball when he didn't make the Crestfallen Knight, who was like a European looking knight, black. Okay, that's great. You know, Blue Point Games, they think, I don't know if the atmosphere of Demon's Souls is really on point, so let's change it. Let's make it more cartoony. Let's make it like World of Warcraft. Like Miyazaki literally face palming in the bowl of ramen, you know? Like, what the fuck? As if the atmosphere of Demon's Souls isn't like one of those key fundamentals that must be remade faithfully. And this is kind of like a mild example. I mean, most people consider the Demon's Souls remake as good. Only like a severe Demon Souls autist like myself would probably take issue. But when it comes to the Silent Hill 2 remake from Bloober Team, hold up, you know, because I've got a couple of things to say about it. But before I get into my opinion, the general consensus has not been particularly positive, especially after the last couple of trailer premieres. I mean, we're getting a sense that this Silent Hill 2 remake is not going to be like the Resident Evil 1 GameCube remake, it's not going to be faithful. It's going to be for quote unquote modern audiences. Now, this is kind of how they explain away the fact that for some reason it's no longer even an issue that video game remakes completely diverge from the source material. And this isn't just a Western problem, obviously. We have seen the kabuki clowns at Square Enix completely mismanage the Final Fantasy VII remake trilogy project. I mean, why is it even a trilogy in the first place? Some kind of multi-dimensional alternate universe. And the fact is, you call your game remake and it's not a remake. It's just an alternate universe fan fiction that cashes in on the brand recognition of the original game. Wow. I should sue these fucks for false advertisement and also damage to my sanity. After waiting for 20 years and being baited constantly by this company, you know, they release this, just the most cynical theme park version of FF7, completely missing a lot of the themes, the tone, the atmosphere, the gameplay, the story. Like, this is what we're calling a remake in 2024. Do we need a new term for projects like the Silent Hill 2 remake? Or the Resident Evil 2 remake, for that matter, which was an over-the-shoulder, third-person, fully 3D game. Unlike the original, unlike the GameCube remake, we're looking at a revision here. These are revisions. Are you going to play the new Final Fantasy VII revision? No, I'm not, because it's developed by total retards who have no clue what they're doing, so I'm going to sit that out. Hey, are you going to play the new Silent Hill 2 revision from Bloober Team? No, I'm not, because they have ESG consultation that apparently means the character Maria cannot be wearing her original costume because it's too sexy and that's sexist and women will be harmed if they see it, even though it's part of her character, even though she herself is this like apparition conjured by the libido of the guilt-ridden main character, James. Of course, he would see this doppelganger of his dead wife who died of a horrible illness as this kind of idealized form as opposed to who she really was, you know? There's this psychological thing going on. Ah, you know what? Anita from Sweet Baby Inc. says throw it in the trash. Give her like a leather jacket that covers her up. Like, what is this about? 
Really, is Maria's character design, like, offensive? Did anybody think that Maria, the character from SH2, had, like, an offensive character design? Well, she has a short skirt and you can see her belly. Like, we live in a culture in the West where women turn 18 and then prostitute themselves on OnlyFans. Is it that she's a character enjoyed by male gamers? Is that it? Change for the sake of change as an act of cultural conquest, perhaps? Why does James look like a HIV-positive Ashkenazi Jewish porn star with dyed blonde hair? Bloober team are hacks. I played Layers of Fear, or at least I tried to get through it. It was boring and amateurish. You know what, guys? You're hired, right? Perfect. Team Silent, one of the most insanely intense survival horror developers of all time. Bloober Team. A walking simulator, and then, oh no, did that chair move? Pretty scary, man. Wait a minute, I turned around, and the room's different. How about we experience that 70 more times? It's genius. Hire these guys. They should remake Silent Hill 2. Can I just reiterate, I hate how the characters look in this remake project, man. James looks retarded, as I mentioned before. Did they redesign Angela to be comedically fat on purpose? These are the mysteries of modern video game development, folks, where the lines between incompetence and political correctness become blurred. But, you know, moving on to the Metal Gear Solid 3 remake project, Metal Gear Solid Delta Snake Eater. Which, when I heard the announcement of this, I was like, uh, yikes. But judging by the material I'm looking at, it does seem like they are trying to remake the original game. I'm seeing scenes played out one-to-one, -one, you know? Like, the new character model for Snake looks identical. It's very respectful to the original model. And yet, in ultra-high definition. Like, okay, pretty impressed. The boss... Looks a little bit more scuffed. I mean, it's not too bad. But in my opinion, the true measurement of this project's success as a genuine remake really comes down to the depiction of Eva. The sultry femme fatale, the KGB CIA double agent. I mean, this is the kind of character that journalists and modern devs absolutely loathe. And at the making of this video, we have not seen her updated design yet, so... Another impending case of politically motivated censorship, perhaps? I hope not, because what a great character. Very representative of just how awesome classic video games could be. You know, she's this, like, deadly spy-slash-bond girl who you don't know, is she good, is she bad, like, what's going on with her? Character design itself hewn into existence by the male gaze of Yoji Shinkawa. Stellar, you know, like she's wearing this bikini underneath her motorcycle overall. Cleavage on full display, modeled with a craftsman's finesse. Kudos to Kojima and the boys. Of course, this was back when Kojima was into biological women. 